as we read what many well-known people throughout history have written about their understanding of faith, uh, we find a mixture of truth and of error, of insight, of confusion, of wishful thinking, or even longing. Longing for something to believe in. Longing for a person, a perspective, where, where people might find rest, where they might find hope and, and confidence for their soul, so that they might know that all's well. But none of those people who have given us their opinions about faith, no matter how articulate they might be, or how well educated they are, or how brilliant they are or were, None of those people has been able to improve upon the words of the Holy Spirit through the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11 concerning faith. That is true faith. Because it is in that chapter that we see that only faith in God, only faith in Christ is faith. And the writer tells us that Christ is the only person in whom we can place our trust. In his blood. In his sacrifice for us. Anything else, anything else, is just a delusion. It is a mirage. It is a lie. With no real substance. And with no real worth. And so as God places that kind of faith in our heart... And we put the full weight of our confidence in Him. We trust the God of the universe for the salvation of our soul. We trust Him. We build our life on Christ. The writer tells us that without that kind of faith in God, without that kind of faith in Christ, it is impossible to arrive at the right perspective on life. Impossible. It's impossible to think clearly about the things that really matter, about spiritual things, about eternal things, about we where we will spend our eternity. And the writer of Hebrews points out that this is nothing new. It has been this way from the beginning. Faith is the only basis upon which we can build a relationship with God. And he tells us, look in the Bible. Look in the Old Testament. God has given us examples of men and of women who have placed their faith in God. They've placed their faith in Him by faith. A man by the name of Abel worshipped God in the way that God told him to worship. He was obedient to the word of God. He was obedient to the light that he had been given. He did it God's way instead of his own way. And we're told that God was pleased with him. And 800 years later, there was another man, a man... Another man who who pleased God, a man by the name of Enoch. A man, we are told, who walked with God for over 300 years. His life, his long life, was a testimony to God and to man. He was a witness to his friends, to his neighbors, to his family. We might ask ourselves, could the Lord say that about us? When people see us, do they see something of Christ? Well, in Enoch's day, the people saw something of the one true God in him. And so God was so pleased with him. We're told he removed him from the earth without him ever dying. He was taken up to the glory of heaven. Taken home to be with the Lord before the judgment of God fell upon this earth. Why? Because of his faith. Because of his obedience to God. And without faith, the writer tells us, in Hebrews chapter 
11, verse 6. It is impossible to please God. It's impossible. No way. No way. Those who would approach the very throne of grace, those who would draw near to the God of heaven and earth, must believe in Him. They must believe that He is a loving and a gracious God who reaches out to us so that we might be saved through the sacrifice of His Son. So we might be saved from the wrath that is to come. We might be rescued from the judgment that will fall upon this earth. And that is the kind of faith that was demonstrated in the life of a man by the name of Noah. Noah was warned by God that judgment was about to fall on this earth. A warning that also came through his grandfather, a man by the name of Methuselah. Because that name Methuselah means when he departs, then judgment will come. It shall be sent. It's quite a name to have. And though we're told in Genesis chapter 5 that Methuselah lived for 969 years, keep reading the verse, because it says after that, he died. None of us, not even Methuselah, no matter how long we may live, can escape death. Then, we're told, we will face the God of the universe, who alone can cast us into a lake of fire forever. Better to trust in Christ now as our Savior than to face him as our judge in eternity. So with the death of Methuselah, the judgment of God was about to be unleashed upon this earth. Why? We're told because of the wickedness of man. Because of the evil in his heart. That his heart was continually full of evil. Because they had rejected God. They rejected God as their God. They had other gods. They had other interests. Matthew 24, 38 says they were busy. They were very busy with their lives. Too busy to care about God. We're told there that it says they were eating, they were drinking, they were were marrying and being given in marriage. Life was full, but it was only full of themselves. They didn't care about the things of the Lord. No time. There was no time for Him. Does that sound familiar? It's much the same way today, isn't it? It was a dark, and it was a difficult time in those days of Noah. But in Genesis chapter 6, we're told that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace. We're told that when God looked at him, with all his sin, with all his shortcomings... With all his failures, he saw a man of integrity. It says he saw a righteous man. Not a perfect man. He was far from that, wasn't he? And we can read in the Bible about his mistakes and his bad decisions and his sins. But we are also told that he was a man who desired to be obedient to the commands of the Lord. He lived among the corruption and the rottenness of that time, but he did not walk according to the pattern of that time. Instead, we're told, he walked with God. He walked with God every day of his life. And so the Lord spoke to Noah. The way he speaks to us today, the way he speaks to those of us who know him, who walk with him, he speaks through his word. And so God spoke to Noah, and he said, the end of all flesh has come before me. 
For the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the whole earth. Destroy them with a great flood. A great flood of water. A flood that will cover the earth. But where would that flood come from? Come from the sky? Would it come from the ground? Genesis chapter 2 tells us that when God wanted to water the ground, he sent up a mist from the ground in order to water the vegetation of the earth. Maybe no one in, in Noah's day even knew what rain was. Maybe they had no idea what a flood was. Maybe they'd never seen it before. And incredible, as incredible as these words may have sounded to Noah, by faith, we're told. By faith, in believing what God had said to him, we're told Noah, being warned by God about this impending disaster, krematizo in Greek, when this information was given to him by divine revelation, he took the warning to heart. Even though we're told in verse 7, these Things. These were things that were not yet seen. The sun was still shining. The breeze was still blowing. The weather report didn't call for any unusual weather. All that Noah had, all that he could rely upon, was the word of God. And for those of us who walk by faith, true faith, that's all we need. All we need is the word of God, because we believe what he has told us in his word. And we either believe all of it, or in reality, we believe none of it, because all of it is his word. But we're told Noah believed God. Out of all the people on the earth at that time, there was a man who believed the God of the universe. How do we know that? Because it says that he did all that the Lord commanded him to do, and that is the measure of faith. That is the measure of true belief when we are willing to walk in obedience to what God has said in his word. That is faith. So in reverence, the writer says, verse 7, chapter 11, you la my. Noah carefully took hold of those words. He embraced them. He didn't ignore them. He didn't reject them. He didn't twist them. But we are told he took them seriously. And he valued them. He was confident that when he heard those words, that they were the truth, since he heard it from the very mouth of God. That is how we are to look at his word, the very mouth of God, as he speaks to us. And so his response was a response of obedience. He responded in obedience to the command of God in humble respect for his creator. He didn't complain. He didn't argue with God. He didn't question the wisdom of those words as incredible as those words were. Something we like to do sometimes. But instead, in devotion, to him, we are told that Noah did not delay. He prepared an ark. Kata skuatso. He built a ship. A ship that looked more like a large wooden box. No sails. There was no rudder. There was no way to steer it. But, what is important is he constructed it according to the specifications that had been given to him 
by God. He didn't deviate from the plan. It was to be a ship of 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It was to have three levels, three decks. Because God said that there would need to be room because there were, there were going to be a great amount of animals who were also going to be on that ship. And in order to make it watertight, God told them how to do it. He said, cover it inside and out with pitch, kofir, covering of resin from plant or, or trees to seal it. Same word, same root word as another Hebrew word, uh, kalfar, which means to cover with the price of a life, covering for sin. Get the idea? Jesus Christ is that covering. His blood is the covering for our sin. He covers it with his blood. He keeps out the waters of the judgment of God. This is a picture of Christ. Even in judgment, it's a picture of Christ, an ark. We're told, for the salvation, sotaria, for the deliverance of Noah's entire household. Salvation from the danger, salvation from the disaster of a worldwide flood. For us, think about it. What is that ark? Isn't that ark Jesus Christ? Isn't he the one that we need to run to? The one who is our only deliverance? The one who provides salvation and safety from the waters of judgment? Christ is that ark. Now for Noah, this was a, uh, this was a massive undertaking, wasn't it? Overwhelming, an overwhelming assignment. It would have demanded all of his time. All of his attention, probably all of his funds as well. And even after his three sons were born, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and even with their help, when they were old enough to help, this was a project, we're told, that took over 100 years to complete. Noah spent 100 years carrying out one single command of God. And he diligently followed the instruction. He diligently followed the specifications that had been given to him by God. That's obedience, isn't it? Isn't that faith? For a hundred years? Remember, Noah was probably nowhere near a large body of water. But he was going to build an ocean-going vessel where there was no ocean, where there was only dry land. And maybe in the beginning, maybe even his family thought that uh, he was being a bit too much. Sometimes, sometimes our obedience to Christ, sometimes our faith in him, appears to be foolish to those who are around us. To those who don't understand, even to those who don't know the Lord. We may be, we may appear to be wasting our time, wasting our lives. Noah's life was consumed with building an ark. There was no career. There was no downtime. There was no slowing down. Just the commitment to build an ark. Because he knew God had told him that judgment was coming and it was coming soon. So Noah began chopping down trees. Certainly an act of faith. Each time one of those trees hit the ground, 
It would have taken a lot of a lot of trees to build that ark. We walk by faith. One step at a time. We walk by faith one tree at a time. Faith by which we're told. Noah condemned the world. Kata, katakrino. His life rebuked them. His life highlighted and brought to their attention their sin. That is what the life of faith does. That is what a life of obedience does. The world. The world cannot accept those who truly follow Jesus Christ because it exposes the foulness of their sin. Noah was different from the people all around him. With every beam that he cut, with every plank of wood that he put in place, with every sound of the hammer, late at night, And early in the morning, the message was clear. The message was the same. Day after day. And year after year. And the message was this. Get ready. Repent. For judgment is coming. The judgment of God is coming, and we are told that Acts 17.30, it says, God commands all men everywhere to repent and to come to him for salvation. Nothing has changed. But the problem with some of us today is that we have heard the sound of that hammer for too long. We've heard the sound. We've heard the words, the call to repent. We've heard it so many times. We don't hear it anymore. It means nothing to us. We're past hearing. We're numb to the voice of God as he calls out to us. It shows us our need of the danger that we are in without a relationship with Jesus Christ. A warning that the writer of Hebrews brought to the attention of those who heard this letter read to them. Second Peter 2, 5. Peter called uh, Noah a preacher of righteousness. A messenger who proclaimed a message from God, a message of the righteousness of God, and that because of the righteousness of God, judgment was about to fall upon them. But part of the message was also that God had provided a means of deliverance. And that was right in front of them. In fact, it was under construction. What did the people do? They persisted in their sin. They persisted in their wickedness and their unbelief. They they refused. They refused to turn to God from their rebellion, from their immorality. They rejected the only means of their salvation. And what was the result? We know, right? We're told they all perished. Every one of them drowned. But the truth became evident to them, didn't it? When it started to rain, and the valleys began to fill up with water, and everything on earth had become submerged. Then it was too late, wasn't it? It was too late, because we're told... God shut the door to the ark. It was too late. There will come a time when it will be too late. Too late to come to Christ. 
the waters are beginning to rise, even today. But it wasn't too late for Noah, was it? Or his wife? Or his three sons and their wives? Eight people. Eight people in all were inside the ark. In Christ. They were saved from the flood. So after over a hundred years of preaching, only eight people were saved. And although those people were part of the family, not a very successful ministry by today's standards of measurement, but God's ways are different from our ways. And his measure of success is different from our measure of success. Noah's assignment was to warn the people of the earth that judgment was coming, and that is exactly what he did. He was faithful to carry out what God had given him to do. But even with that, we're told in Genesis 6, 6, God was grieved. He was grieved in his heart because of the judgment that must come upon the people. And so, in his mercy, he waited a hundred years for people to repent. Even after he shut the door of the ark, we're told he waited another seven days. First Peter 3.20, Peter says that in the days of Noah, while the ark was being constructed, God waited patiently. He waited for over a hundred years. You know, he's still waiting for people to come to Christ. Because he knows that judgment will fall upon this earth. And though they had a hundred years, over a hundred years, we may not have that long to repent. And Noah may not have thought of himself as a shipbuilder. May not have thought of himself as a preacher. But by faith, he was obedient to the call that God had placed upon his life. He was obedient to the task that had been given to him. And so we are told in verse 7, he became an heir of the righteousness, a son of righteousness, the Ayasune, a son, part of the family of what is right, what's correct, what has value to God? What is acceptable to Him? What is true? Which is, the writer tells us, according to faith. According to faith in God. According to faith in Christ. So the testimony of Noah remains with us. Even today, he walked with God in obedience to his word. He believed the word of God and he lived by that faith in him. By faith, he chopped down one tree at a time for over a hundred years. And so we're told he was delivered from the judgment of God, both he and his household. And we'd be like him in that way. Even like the psalmist, when we're asked, why do we hope in Jesus Christ? Well, our answer could be this. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the creator, the sustainer of both heaven and earth. He is my strength. He's my song. And he has become my salvation. So with that bitter word of judgment, judgment that is about to fall upon this earth, comes a sweet word of mercy and of hope and of rest and of confidence, of faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You've been 
listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.